morning and welcome everyone to San Diego Humane Society's Behavior and Training Lecture on Promoting Successful Interactions Between Dogs and Children. My name is Carrie Owens. I'm a Community Animal Training Coordinator at San Diego Humane Society. I'm also a certified professional dog trainer and a licensed Family Paws parent educator. I'm excited to present this lecture on interactions between dogs and children to you. And what better time to hold this topic than during Dog Bite Prevention Week? I'm hoping we'll cover many topics tonight that will promote strong and respectful relationships between the dogs and children in your community. To give you a roadmap, here are the subjects we're covering tonight. Dog communication, how dogs send signals to the world around them. Child development and how it relates to a child's ability to conduct interactions with dogs how a child should approach and pet a dog, how to manage safe interactions inside any home, fun activities dogs and kids can do together, and a brief overview of resources for training support if needed. Let's dive in. I'm gonna start off talking about dog communication. Dogs use their communication skills to convey their feelings and needs and to make things happen in their environment. The primary way a dog communicates with the world around them is with their body language. Dogs tend to use vocalizations as a secondary mode of communication. This means reading your dog's body language or another dog's body language is a huge factor in understanding their feelings, needs, and what they are asking for from the environment. We'll discuss the areas of the body that send communication signals and certain vocalizations to note in a little bit. First, we're going to cover the main messages dogs send when they are communicating with us and the world around them. We can boil down dog communication to the dog requesting one of two things. For that thing, for our circumstances, the thing is a person, to either increase their distance with the dog, create space, and possibly to end the interaction, or to decrease distance with the dog, get closer, and possibly continue an interaction. Dogs intake communication signals from the world in the same order. Body language first, and vocalizations as a secondary tool. This means dogs focus on our stance, posture, and movements just as much as they listen to our vocal tones and words. We'll keep this in mind when we discuss the topic of child development and how it relates to a child's ability to conduct interactions with dogs. The main body parts of a dog that will communicate the message of either increase your distance with them or decrease your distance with them are as follows. Eyes, ears, mouth, face orientation, body weight, and tail. We'll break down some common body language cues for both distance increasing and distance decreasing signals for all of these categories. Then we'll test out our skills with some examples. First category are the eyes. What we're looking for to indicate distance decreasing signals is soft eye contact. The dog in this picture is a perfect example of a dog providing soft eye contact. Some signs that would be distance increasing in the eyes would be a furrowed brow. The dog in the picture slightly has a furrowed brow. It's most likely just kind of confused. You can see the head is cocked to the side, um, but a furrowed brow, a hard stare, or if you can see the whites of a dog's eyes, we call this whale eye. Those would all be considered distance increasing signals. The dog would be asking for more space and therefore we would know that we should create that space, whether it's us or the child that is interacting with the dog. Next category is the ears. Distance decreasing signals would be neutral ear position meaning just relax on the body, no muscle tension, notice anywhere, no wrinkles of the forehead, not pulled forward or pulled back. With that being said, distance increasing signals, so please give me space, 
would be ears pulled forward dramatically or ears pulled back. Something to keep in mind about reading dog body language is it's all about the entire picture. So you might see the ears pulled forward, but that might be accompanied with soft eye contact and other signals that might be saying, you can decrease your, your distance with me. Um, so we do like to read all the signals at once together, but typically we will see ears either pulled forward or back with other distance increasing signals. So it could be ears back, I'm not feeling very good, kind of fearful, ears forward, I might be a little too excited or fearful as well. Next category is the mouth. Distance decreasing signals for the mouth would be a loose mouth, uh, meaning the lips on the mouth are nice and loose. They're not tight against the face. Um, we're not seeing any out of context panting. That would be the dog didn't just go for a run. Um, they're not hot, not trying to cool down. So they're panting for um, other reasons, most likely stress. So distance increasing signals could be panting, could be the mouth um, open with tight lips on the face, could be the lips tight and closed with the lips pursed and the lips pulled forward. Um, we could see yawning, once again, out of context, didn't just wake up from a nap or not feeling sleepy. That would mean that we need extra oxygen to the brain because we are feeling more stress and the blood is pumping faster. Uh, so we need more oxygen in that blood. So we are yawning in response to the stress that we are experiencing, asking for some distance to stop that stress. Another sign would be lip licking. So when a dog is licking their lips, once again, out of context, didn't just drink, didn't just eat. Um, there's no liquid falling from their mouth that they're licking up. That is also a sign to increase distance with them. It says that they are stressed. It is also a self-soothing behavior. If they are in that position though, they are needing to soothe themselves because they're feeling the stress and would like that stress to stop, which we can do by once again, increasing our distance with them. Next category is the face orientation. So is the face facing toward the person or away? Is the head lowered or in a neutral position? Distance decreasing signals would be the face facing toward the person um, and the, the face in a natural position, not lowered. Um, once again, this is always in consideration with the rest of the body. Um, so we will see a picture in a second where the dog is orienting their face towards the person. However, with the rest of the signals, it would not be distance decreasing. <laughs> it's going to be distance increasing. Um, so we always read it all together. But once again, facing toward a person, kind of asking for that interaction, um, usually is distance decreasing. Um, however, if someone is reaching for me and I lean away, turn my head away, that is, no, thank you, distance increasing, please. Same with dogs. Next category is the body weight. Is the body weight shifted forward, leaning into the person? Is it shifting away, just as we were talking about? Am I turning my head away from you? Am I also leaning away from you while I'm turning my head away from you? I really don't want it. Um, that is distance increasing behavior. Um, but if I'm leaning towards and into it, that's distance decreasing. I'm literally decreasing the distance between the two of us. Um, I'm leaning into your pets. I'm leaning into your body. Um, that would be distance decreasing behavior and uh, paw lifts as well. So that would be when you see the dog lifting one of those front paws like this. Um, if we see this along with other body language cues of increase your distance with me, usually it's kind of leaning away, turning our head away or body weight away with the paw lift as well. Um, that is also distance increasing behavior. Sometimes we'll also see it if you're like holding a treat up and the dog's like, oh, what's that? Right. Um, that would be, of course, distance decreasing behavior. Please give me the treat. Um, so once again, we read all the signals as one picture. Uh, but if we do see body weight shifting away um, and the paw lift as well, it usually does mean please increase your distance with me and give me some space. Last category is tail. Uh, so if you do see the tail lowered, if you see the tail tucked, if you see um, the tail high and stiff, those would all be considered uh, distance increasing behaviors. If the tail is loose, if it's natural on the body, just going right off the body and it has some nice movement to it, once again, not 
tight tail wags, not very stiff. Those are all distance decreasing behaviors. Tail tucked, low, um, stiff tail wags, especially low stiff tail wags when the tail is between the dog's legs and it's wagging very stiffly. Those are all distance increasing. Distance decreasing would be motion of the ocean, movement in that tail, very loose there. All right. So now we're going to put our, oh, I'm sorry, before we put our skills to the test, excuse me, vocalizations. I'm always like, yeah, they mainly use their body language. We got vocalizations as well. Um, so the vocalizations to listen for to either increase your distance with the dog or decrease your distance with the dog are uh, vocalizations such as chuffing. Chuffing's not as a familiar vocalization from dogs as things like barking. Um, chuffing is exactly what it sounds like uh, when the dog kind of was like that. It's kind of a half bark, half sigh. Um, it can indicate frustration. Um, it can indicate slight excitement. Either way, the dog is starting to get into an emotional space where they might not make the most calculated, logical decisions. It might be more impulsive decisions and would be a sign where we should, as an adult, step in and ask them to create space with each other, kind of evaluate the situation and uh, coach them from there. Whining would be a sign that would indicate distance increasing behavior. It could be because we're fearful. It also could be because we're getting overly excited. Once again, getting in that state where we, as the dog might not make as good decisions, might be more impulsive, maybe start in jumping, that's an impulsive behavior, or using our mouth, that's another impulsive behavior. Two behaviors that are very undesired on children. Uh, so whining would be a vocalization to look out for during interactions with children. Barking is another vocalization to listen for. It could be one of the two, again, could be fear, could be overexcitement, um, it could be frustration. Uh, either way, it's a sign that we should probably end any interactions that are happening for a short period of time, allow both parties to relax so that when they start interacting again, they can make some really good decisions with each other and continue building that good relationship. Growling is definitely a distance increasing behavior. Uh, immediately would like to increase the distance between the two parties as well as snarling. Snarling would mean that we've we've gone very far um, in, in creating not an ideal interaction between the two parties. And so once again, distance increasing as fast as we possibly could at that time, not meaning to run. Of course, we don't run around dogs, um, but to make a plan, which we're gonna talk about when it is time to leave an interaction with the dog and what that should look like. But those are some body language cues and vocalizations to note while interacting with the dog and how to read their signals. Now we're going to put our skills to the test. We're going to look at some of these pictures together. I'm going to note some of the signals that I'm seeing and say whether I believe those signals would mean that the dog is asking me to decrease my distance with them or increase their my distance with them. Um, I would also encourage folks who feel comfortable doing so to unmute for the next uh, picture we have and point out some signals if they'd like and tell me whether those are distance increasing or distance decreasing. So before we get to that slide, I'll tell you what I see here. So I see this dog has soft eye contact, ears are in a neutral position, Lips on the mouth are relaxed. Um, the mouth is slightly open. The tongue is kind of lightly hanging in that mouth. The face is oriented towards the camera, so I'm assuming that's a person. The body weight is slightly shifting forward towards that person, if not almost even on all four paws. And we can't really see the tail. I feel like the tail is kind of in the picture behind the ears, it might just be a wisp of the, the dog's fur, but if that is the tail, it's in high position. Um, so I would say that this dog is giving me permission to decrease my distance with them and asking for me to approach for an interaction. 
It's important, once again, to read the entire body language as a whole um, and to read the body language throughout the entire interaction to make sure they continuously send you distance decreasing signals. Interacting with dogs is like having a conversation. It's fluid and it can change based on the environment and individuals involved. A dog may at some point say with their body, thank you for the pets, I'm done now. We'll talk later about the steps children can take to make sure the conversation stays positive and ends on a polite note. Now we'll move to the next picture where folks are encouraged to unmute and let me know what signals you are seeing if you'd like. And seeing really wide eyes and I can see the whites. Yes, corner when the dog has their eyes turned and you can see the whites of their eyes, call that whale eye. What that comes from is the dog leaning their body weight away, shifting their body weight away from whatever is ensuing because they wanna send the signal of no thank you, but they're saying I don't trust you enough to take my eyes off of you. Therefore, the eyes turn towards what's ensuing as their body turns away. Eyes go to the left, whites on the right. What we see here in this picture. Other signals we're going to see are the ears are slightly back. The mouth is tight and closed and the lips are slightly pushed forward. So the corners of the mouth here um, are slightly pulled forward. Think about how far back on that dog's cheek they could go. Face is oriented slightly towards the person, but kind of leaning away. The nose is slightly off kilt, off to the side. Body weight is absolutely uneven, shifted away. And we can't really see a tail once again in this picture. I feel like it's kind of off there to the side, um, but I, I bet you it's definitely low. I would say this dog is asking us to increase our distance with them and to give them space and they would not be interested in us approaching or asking for an interaction at this time. These are some really common body language signals that dogs will send to children when children are moving around them. Shifting away, showing that whale eye, kind of getting tight, making themselves a little bit smaller. Um, so these are really good signals for us to be aware of in order to stop interactions before they escalate. We'll be talking briefly about how dogs learn through association and how we want them to create good associations with children, especially children that they will frequently interact with so that they make good behavior decisions when interacting with them in the future. Last practice here, last example. Anybody want to tell me any signal they're seeing from this dog and whether they would increase or decrease their distance with this dog? All right. I see hard staring, ears forward, lips and mouth and are tight and pulled forward as well. Uh, you can even see the teeth of this dog. Can't see the body. I know that was a little difficult. Don't see the tail or the or the body, but I, I guarantee you the body is um, very much shifted forward um, with potentially a, a tail that's high and stiff or maybe even low and stiff. This dog is saying they are so uncomfortable in their environment that they are considering making forward movement with offensive behaviors. So these are definitely signals where we would want to, ideally you'd want to catch some signals before we get to this point, but these are absolutely distance increasing signals right here. For more information on reading dog body language, please watch our Can You Speak Dog and Cat webinar located in the San Diego Humane Society YouTube channel. For those attending today, the follow-up email will have that link to that webinar that you can watch if you'd like. Right, <clears throat> moving on. We're gonna talk about child development and how it affects their ability to interact with the dogs around them. So much like puppies, children develop rapidly from the time they're born to when they're fully developed. During these developmental phases, they obtain new physical and mental abilities that affect the way they interact with the dogs around them. 
It's important to always have adult supervision when a baby and a dog are in the same environment to ensure a successful interaction. Dogs gain comfort from being able to predict the outcomes of their social interactions. Because development causes children to constantly change their physical appearances and mobile abilities, children can seem unpredictable to dogs. Some dogs may experience stress when they're unsure of how to navigate a social interaction. This stress may lead to the dog asking for space to avoid any potential altercations. It's important to watch for those signs of stress or distance increasing signals. In addition to dogs potentially lacking the ability to predict the outcome of an interaction with a child, dogs may experience discomfort during an interaction with a child due to the natural ways children socialize and interact with the world around them. Young toddlers, like the one seen in the photo, lack the ability to see from a far distance. It's common to see babies stare at people and items for long periods of time with wide eyes. Drawing back on our knowledge of dog body language, the baby is sending threatening messages to the dog with their wide eyes and hard stare, which may make the dog respond with threatening messages as well. Infants will also develop new mobile abilities like rolling over, crawling, pulling themselves up, standing, and eventually walking, all within one year. All of these abilities lead to different potentials when interacting with the dog, once again, leading to that unpredictable factor. Young children are unaware of the items they use to assist or balance themselves on while developing these skills. If a dog is around, the child may reach for the dog or lean on the dog, causing the dog to be frightened and experience discomfort. Muscle control and motor skills are still being fine-tuned during this time as well, which leads to sporadic limb movements that may result in some uncomfortable handling as opposed to gentle petting. Keep in mind that dogs are face level with children. Being at this level can cause overstimulation for the child. From the hot breath of the dog to potential face licks, this can cause discomfort in a child and result in even more sporadic movements, which can cause escalatory reactions from the dog. Child is waving around and screaming or squealing because it tickles or it's just too much. It can cause the dog to have those big reactions and actually even go at the child more um, or start to raise their impulsive decisions. So it's always important to supervise interactions to make sure everyone is comfortable, both the child and the dog. Before we move on, looking at the picture here in the slide, just want to note the signals that both the child and the dog are sending to each other. So there are some signals the child is sending to the dog that might make them feel threatened, some of which is the direct eye contact we've already gone over with the wide eyes, the fact that the child is impeding the dog's forward motion, blocking their pathway there, and leaning their body weight toward the dog or hovering over the dog. Some signs we see from the dog that make me believe that's how they feel are their eyes are wide and looking, trying to look away from the child. The face is looking away from the child. The ears are back. The body weight is very much shifted on that shoulder that is furthest away from this baby. So we're, we're very much trying to lean away and our mouth is tight and closed with those lips tight on the face. The dog is sending distance increasing signals and asking for space from this baby. Baby cannot create that space on their own, can't move that fast. This is where that adult supervision would be very handy. Come in, pick up the baby, move them away from the dog. Everybody feels more comfortable. <clears throat> so older children, though they do have the ability to remove themselves quicker than a baby and have a little bit more of developed fine and gross motor skills, um, <clears throat> they are still developing the ability to <clears throat> excuse me, have successful interactions with dogs because of the fact that it's difficult for them to follow multi-step instructions. Because interactions with dogs are constant conversations, do you like this? Do you want me to continue? There are multiple steps to the instructions, which can confuse a child. 
Always having that adult supervision allows an adult to help the child interact with the dog to make sure everyone is comfortable during that interaction and everyone's needs are met. Dogs are interesting and children are curious. They're gonna want to interact with the dog. With children generally developing impulse control between the ages of three to nine, this can cause a child to engage with the dog in some precarious ways that might make the dog extremely uncomfortable. For lacking impulse control, uh, maybe tugging on the tail seems kind of fun. I want to see what happens. I don't know how to control that impulse that I just suddenly have to perform this behavior. So therefore, I might do it. Having that supervision uh, can really help avoid that interaction, that discomfort and potential altercation or escalation of behavior. It can be important to start telling your child that dogs have feelings and they don't like it when you handle them in a certain way, like tugging on their tail. However, young children are still developing the ability to have empathy, so we'll want to rely more heavily on supervision and teaching through example than teaching through the instruction that they have difficulty retaining. Before we move on, can anyone tell me any stress and distance increase signals from the dog in this picture on the slide? The mouth is really tight. Mouth is very tight with those uh, the corner of the lips pulled forward. I see whale eye. You see the whites of the eye in the corner there. This is one of those examples where the body weight is shifted away. However, the face is oriented towards the, the person. This might be a purposeful orientation of the face. We might be getting ready to protect ourselves. However, our body weight is very much shifted away and we are asking for space. These are distance increasing signals towards this child. Something to note about the child uh, interaction with the dog, there is leaning over the dog. That hovering or leaning the body weight over can be threatening posture. And then we also have that direct eye contact there. So if it's difficult for children to retain instructions and understand empathy, how should we teach children to have safe and successful interactions with dogs to promote trusting relationships? Children remember and tend to mimic more of what they see than what they are told. Anybody who's ever spent time with a child knows if you say, do as I say, not as I do, the child's still going to do what you do. This means as adults, we can teach our child how to safely interact with dogs by safely interacting with dogs ourselves. Some good habits are talking in a calm or enthusiastic voice to your dog, even when they perform undesirable behaviors. Scolding or yelling at a dog can be really scary for them. We don't want to set the example of threatening dogs with vocalizations. We'll discuss training resources at the end of this webinar if you're looking for ways to train your dog without using these methods. Another good habit is to display appropriate play styles, such as always playing with a toy and not your body, and avoid roughhousing. This will discourage your child from showing the sporadic movements that come from using your body for playing, like waving your hands, your arms, or your legs. You can also provide consistent cues to your dog, as this will build communication skills between the two of you, but in addition will also help your little one or any other little one mimic the behaviors that will send clear communication signals to your dog that they understand. The more your little one uses those clear signals, the less unpredictable they appear to your dog, and the more your dog gains comfort and trust with them. Lastly, always respect your dog's boundaries when they're sending you distance increasing signals so your child doesn't see a double standard for you and them. You can even narrate a dog's body language signals to tell your child why you're choosing not to approach that dog. For example, 
Oh, Daisy just lip licked, lifted her paw, and leaned away from me when I bent down to pick her up for pets. She must not want me to pick her up right now. This can help the child retain all of your body movements and the information that you're sending to them at that time. Next, we're going to talk about how a child should approach and say hello to a dog that is asking for them to decrease their distance. So speaking of approaching dogs and reading their signals, let's talk about a safe way for children to approach dogs and invite them for an interaction. We're going to break it down into two parts, before the interaction and during the interaction. First, keeping with the theme we already have going, Adult supervision is always recommended when children and dogs are in the same environment. The first step is to ask the pet parent for permission to say hello to their dog. Once you have the approval, have the child stay standing and rotate their shoulders perpendicular to the dog's shoulders. So if you all were the dog facing me, I'm facing you, I would turn my shoulders 90 degrees to be perpendicular with you to the side like this. From there, have the child pat the side of their leg, stay in one spot, and allow the dog to approach them at the dog's pace. You can see in the picture here of a child standing, patting the side of their leg as the dog approaches them. If the dog decides to approach the child, read the dog's body language. Most dogs will want to sniff a new person. If this is the case, allow the dog to stop sniffing before reaching out for pets. If the dog doesn't engage in a sniffing investigation, or if the dog is done sniffing, the child may pet in the green zones as seen in the picture. The shoulders, side of the abdomen, and along the back are all comfortable places for children to pet dogs. Have the child take a break from petting by pulling their hand back every two to three pets to see if the dog is still interested in the interaction. We call the, these petting breaks. If the dog leans into the child, pause at the child to continue, or looks at them like, why'd you stop? These are distance decreasing signals and you know you have the green light to keep petting. If the dog begins to give distance increasing signals, have the child calmly turn their back to the dog and begin walking away. So from the side angle that they are at, would turn fully back, my back to you, and just start walking the opposite way. If a child is under the age of four and is interested in interacting with a dog, I recommend performing guided touch petting. This is where an adult holds the wrist of a child to control their movements towards the dog to make sure the petting is gentle and can perform petting breaks. So you would grab the wrist of the other child and gently guide the hand on the dog. And then you can guide the hand away for those petting breaks to see what the dog does, read their body language cues to know if you should continue the interaction or stop it. I know this is going to sound wildly unpopular, but please discourage hugs between children and dogs. Ideally discourage hugs between all humans and dogs, but definitely children. Hugging a dog is extremely uncomfortable and causes them to feel threatened. There are multiple aspects to hugs that cause this feeling. The closeness of the faces the eye contact that goes with it, the body weight hovering over the dog, the squeezing of the dog, and of course that restriction of movement, which can lead to escalated efforts to get away. And it might be the nipping of the face that is the closest thing to them because it's on the body. It's again, dog bite prevention week. Hugging is sometimes that behavior that can lead to bites. So please discourage hugging of any dog. Um, in addition, also please discourage any riding of dogs, so getting on their back um, and trying to ride them, um, or any other type of rough handling, such as pulling on the leash, pulling on the collar. The child here with the pug in the picture will want to avoid that. 
We want dogs to create good and safe interactions with the children around them. This will promote trusting relationships that will lead to desirable, calm, and safe behaviors. <clears throat> there are times where it's never recommended to approach or ask for an interaction with the dog. These times are listed below. When a dog is sleeping, it's rude to interrupt anyone's sleep, but it can be extremely startling for dogs. This can cause a startle or fear response like nipping or potentially other behaviors. And it's something we just don't really want to make a habit of. We don't want your dog feeling like they can't decompress and get that much needed sleep that they need for quality of life. We also don't want your dog associating your child or any other child with getting startled awake. I know we all at one point were awoken for school and that was not a fun experience. We don't like that. Uh, we don't want to be woken up out of our sleep. So when dogs are sleeping is a really good time to have the child and the dog separated and not have any type of interactions. When a dog is eating, it can be natural for a dog to become uncomfortable around a resource like food. In the picture here on the slide, you'll see a dog showing typical resource guarding behaviors over their food. You'll see the ears are pushed forward. Notice the wrinkles on the forehead because of the muscles. The brow is furrowed. The eyes are hard and staring. The lips are pursed and tight. And the body is hovering over the food and the head is sl slightly lowered. Never approach a dog who is eating especially if they've shown these signals as a response to someone approaching them when they're eating. Another time to keep dogs and children separated is when a dog has a bone or a chew, something like a bully stick, a pig ear, or a rawhide, or is already playing with a toy by themselves. This can also elicit resource guarding behaviors, so it's a good time to just ask the child to wait until the dog does not have one of those resources. When dogs are playing with each other is another time to avoid interactions with children and dogs. Children can get knocked over and become injured by the dogs. Children can also overstimulate the playing dogs and potentially cause an altercation amongst those dogs or potentially have one of those dogs redirect their behavior onto the child. And of course, we'll want to avoid saying hi when a dog is showing noticeable distance increasing signals. To better illustrate why we recommend avoiding interactions during these times, here's a short video our communications team developed called How Would You Like It? After watching that video, it really puts our handling toward our dog into perspective because one of the many ways dogs learn is through association. Does this make me feel good or does this make me feel bad? We'll want to create as many good associations with children to help dogs, our dogs, anyone's dogs, associate kids with good feelings. Good feelings lead to calm behaviors and successful and safe interactions. Sometimes signals are missed, 
or there's a dog who is an outlier and shows zero to little warning signals before they show escalated behavior. This can be a young dog that is still developing their ability to control their impulses and is jumping all over a child with an open mouth, or a dog who is not overly excited, but rather so fearful they're about to make forward offensive movement like snapping or biting. For excitable dogs, tell a child to power down their robot. This is where they turn their head down and look at the hands that they place in their lap while standing. You can see the picture of me doing this off to the right hand side. The two things that this exercise should help with is to eliminate the excitement from the dog by avoiding direct eye contact because the eyes are looking into the hands and to avoid getting overly excited from movement because we're staying still. During this time, an adult should come and redirect the dog to a different location to avoid the dog performing the behavior towards the child again. For dangerous dogs, have your child practice becoming a rock. Crouch down with the head facing toward the ground over the knees and hold the hands interlocked over the neck. This will protect the most important body parts from any type of injury. See the picture below for an example. Dogs who have shown resource guarding signals or behaviors or dogs who have bitten and broken skin are usually good candidates to avoid interactions with. If your dog or a dog your child commonly interacts with falls into this category, we'll have resources for you at the end. So did you run into the dog that rejected your child's offer to approach by sending distance increasing signals? Or maybe your dog is the dog that needs to reject a child from approaching because they are feeling uncomfortable. No worries. We have some alternatives to petting to help a child still feel like they received the interaction they were hoping for with a cute doggy. You can have the child wave, say hello doggy, or my favorite, Low kisses. If the pet parent is okay with their dog getting treats and is able to get you those treats safely, you can even have the child lightly toss the treats at the dog's feet. Avoid having the dog take the treat from the child's hand if they're already showing stress or distance increasing behaviors. We'll talk more about why later on. We've mentioned the importance of adult supervision once or twice throughout this presentation. Let's talk about how to make this a realistic expectation in a home with children and dogs. Adults are busy creatures. We don't always have time to just sit and watch our child interact with a dog. We got you. Let's talk about how to create the safe zones for those times that we can't supervise, but know there's a potential for children and dogs to interact. First, let's talk about when to use these safe zones. A good time would be when you cannot directly supervise as an adult, when the dog is sleeping at night, and ideally when they're taking a nap during the day to avoid a child interacting with them, either intentionally or unintentionally. As a trainer, I've heard of children tripping over dogs that are sleeping, especially in the middle of the night. Another good time to use these safe zones is when a dog is eating or has any of those toys or chews that we were just talking about. When a child has food themselves, I always kind of imagine that the dog is um, Dwight from the office asking Jim, hey, do you want to form an alliance with me? Hey, you want to drop some food on the ground and I'll eat it? Um, we don't want to form this habit. It can potentially cause some type of fixation from the dog to get food from your child. Um, so having some separation during this time would be really helpful. So your dog doesn't get the food that they're not supposed to have. And so um, we don't build those bad habits. And of course, if a dog is showing any overly excited or fearful behaviors, it's a really good time to have separation between the two and have the dog go into a safe zone, go into your home base away, where the child and the dog cannot interact. We can use these safe zones in our home, but also in someone else's home if they have a dog, 
or if someone is visiting our home and they have a dog as well. So what do these zones look like? They should be areas with barriers that a child cannot enter. The zones are to provide decompression time and or peace of mind for your dog that they do not need to be on guard for a potential interaction with a child. It's kind of like creating a bedroom for your dog. You can create these safe zones with expandable pet gates, pet pens, and crates. You can take an expendable pet gate and split a living room in half, create a circle, or make a U shape up against the wall to create a more confined space for your dog. You can even put it up to a back door so the dog can walk inside and be confined, but then also still have access to going outside if they'd like. Dog pens are a little bit heavier duty options of expandable gates. I recommend these pens for bigger dogs or dogs who tend to jump on the gate and may potentially knock them over. You can see the uh, the uh, pen in the bottom left-hand corner. The expandable gate is going to be in the bottom right-hand corner. You can also use a crate. However, I would only utilize the crate for a short period of time, such as 30 minutes to one hour. Crates tend to be small and are better for sleeping as opposed to just hanging out. I like to have safe zones already set up in the living area and the bedroom. This can be helpful for everyday life. Young kiddos eat often, which means we don't want to go far to put our dog in a safe zone every time we give them a snack. Depending on your home layout, you may need more of these zones throughout your home for convenience. The point of these zones is to help your dog relax in the home which means we'll want to create good associations with the areas as they might feel a little anxious being confined and separated from you at first. You can build good associations with these zones by feeding your dog in them, providing chews and bones when they're in them, or by giving them mental enrichment activities to interact with. You'll see a mental enrichment activity at the bottom of this slide with the muffin tin and the frozen treats inside of each indentation. These puzzle contraptions ask our dogs to use their cognitive skills to figure out what canine specific behavior to use in order to solve the puzzle. Not only do these activities allow your dog to be a dog in an appropriate way, but they also tire your dog out and lower their stress levels. We'll talk more about mental enrichment activities and how it involves between how we can involve children and dogs with those activities later. It's important to build a strong and trusting relationship between the family dog and children of the home. We're going to go over some fun and safe activities a child can do with a dog to facilitate that bond. A good old game of fetch is always exciting for all parties. I recommend having smaller children in a learning tower or standing on a sturdy chair. This way, this, this will make the child not be at eye level with the dog and help the child throw the ball over the dog's head as opposed to directly at it. As mentioned earlier, providing your child with the ability to communicate with your dog can do wonders for comfort levels. Invite your child to engage in training games that use positive reinforcement methods to promote good associations and communication. Hide and seek is, a great, is great for teaching your dog recall and building excitement for approaching your child. Have your child hide with a training treat in their hand while your dog waits beside you. Tell your child to call out your dog's name once they've found their hiding spot and watch your dog excitedly search for your little one. Once they've found your child, have the child give the dog the treat and tell them they're a good dog. We're going to see a clip of a training game called the Wedding March in a few seconds from a video called How to Teach Kids About Dog Body Language in Training. The video is created by Elisa Rose, who is the owner of the dog training company Legends Dog Training. Of course, we recommend to always do these exercises or activities with adult supervision. Abilities. Young kids ages three to five will love this training game. I call it 
popping lily pads. Show your little one how to deliver treats one at a time on a lily pad. These are actually called poly spots and they are commonly used for kids and athletic programs. Have your kid deliver three to five treats at each poly spot. Then call out a new color and have your kid move to the next spot. The reason this game is so helpful is because it teaches kids to invite dogs to approach them instead of advancing on the dog's space. Interaction should always be posed as an invitation, never forced. Delivering treats to a spot will also promote confidence in kids that might be nervous about delivering treats directly to a dog's mouth. This is also a great idea for dogs that might be uncertain or grabby when taking treats. The poly spots create a physical target that will make the rules of the training easier to understand. A parent or guardian should actively supervise these interactions so that they can offer guidance as necessary. Beatrix, come! Older or more confident kids ages six and above may do better with moving exercises. Set the poly spots in a line about two to three feet from a fence line or wall. The poly spots should be spaced out at four foot intervals. Your kid can walk from poly spot to poly spot, stopping at each one. Once your kid stops, your dog will likely stop also. Have your kid deliver food to your dog when they stop. It doesn't matter if your dog is standing or sitting, as long as your dog has four paws on the ground. This exercise encourages calm, indirect body language and will improve trust and communication between dogs and kids. You may also find that this exercise can carry over to a better connection and synchronization of movement when out for walks or on a hike. Right. Some more activities your child can participate in are playing and prepping enrichment games. They can play scent work games like hiding a treat in a room and having the dog conduct a room search or asking the dog to choose what cup the treat is under out of three cups. Get three cups, turn them over, treat is under one, move them around, ask the dog to pick which cup the treat is under, might indicate with their nose or with their paw. Children can also prep mental enrichment activities like meatballs. Meatballs are made out of combining <clears throat> slimy wet dog food and kibble. And then we can take those and stuff them into a Kong, we can make those meatballs and put them in a muffin tin, making it harder for the dog to figure out how to pick it up and out. You can smear that creamy mixture on a licking mat. Kids can also help load puzzle toys, make homemade snuffle mats, or even a cardboard obstacle course. You can get more ideas for mental enrichment activities in our enrichment webinar found on San Diego Humane Society's YouTube channel. One of my favorite activities for dogs and children to do together is reading. This can help a child's confidence while learning to read, and it can help the dog create safe and calm associations with the child, as it's an activity where the child isn't just laser focused on the dog. If you do happen to have a dog that has been showing more fearful signs towards children, here are some ways to boost their confidence. First, Always go at your dog's pace and never coerce them into any interaction. Coercion doesn't feel good, which, mean your which means your dog will remember and potentially associate that bad feeling with children. Plus, coercion can lead to escalated fearful behaviors from a dog, potentially leading to forward offensive behaviors. Something else you can do is pair children with getting treats from you. This is a wonderful way to help your dog associate children with good things like getting treats without ever having to take treats from children. When you notice your dog sees children at a distance, say yes and give them a treat. Keep giving them treats about every 33 seconds as long as they're still focusing on the child. If your dog starts to show distance increasing behaviors, Stop the exposure and let your dog decompress. An exercise a child living in the home with a fearful dog can do is a treat drive-by. When a dog is in their safe zone, meaning children and dogs cannot directly interact or touch each other, 
have a child walk by at a distance and toss the treat into the safe zone. Ideally, the child will keep their shoulders perpendicular to the child or to the, the dog, so not facing directly towards the dog at the side, and toss that treat in. Do this multiple times throughout the day to help the fearful dog pair the presence and movements of the child with good things, like getting treats. Older kids can play the treat retreat game with the fearful dog in their home. Have the dog in the safe zone and the older kid with treats in their pocket or pouch. The older kid will start by tossing a treat at the dog's feet and let them eat that treat. Then toss a treat behind the dog. Once the dog has turned around to eat the treat behind them, they will reset their stance and wait for that next treat. Restart the process. Toss a treat at the dog's feet, then another one behind them. The idea of this game is to allow the dog to get as close to the person as they are comfortable with, as opposed to getting closer to the person because they have the treat. The dog should ideally get closer to the edge of the safe zone the longer the child continues the exercises. If at any point during this presentation you thought, ha, easier said than done about any of the suggestions we have made, we get it. We have different training resources to help you make these suggestions a reality and start promoting successful interactions between the children and dogs around you. San Diego Humane Society alone has multiple resources to help fulfill this idea. We also feature external training resources to help you fulfill successful interactions. San Diego Humane Society will be hosting a pay to attend Dogs and Toddlers webinar on the last Sunday of every month starting in May of this year, 2024. Under the behavior and training services on our website, you'll find an entire a uh, host of resources, such as the page for children and dogs to promote safety. We also have other resources for basic training or mild to moderate behavior modification training. Check out San Diego Humane Society's training class page for more information on basic obedience training, private training held on our campuses, right now San Diego and Escondido, or group classes. If you're more interested in having someone come into your home, we have some phenomenal trainers featured on our trainer directory, some of which will be licensed Family Paws parent educators. Look for FPPE next to their name. These trainers can also be found on the trainer directory in the Behavior and Training Service page. You'll see you can also visit the Family Paws website directly for some resources regarding dogs and children you can visit familypaws.com. For the dogs who have shown escalated behaviors, we would recommend working with a veterinary behaviorist or a certified dog behavior consultant to receive the assistance needed to fulfill safe and successful interactions. Both veterinary behaviorists and certified dog behavior consultants are featured in the trainer directory on our website. The behaviors that would constitute the need to work with one of these individuals include bites and nips that have broken the skin, overt signals of resource guarding, rapid escalation of behavior. This means a dog that does not show warning signals or beginning signals that they want to increase distance before making forward offensive movement. If you have any questions about what would qualify for working with a veterinary behaviorist or a certified dog behavior consultant, please feel free to stick around after and ask questions. With that being said, thank you so much for attending the behavior and training lecture on promoting successful interactions between dogs and children. You have all been a pleasure to host. We're going to open it up for questions now.